There are big boats, there are fast boats, and then there are, well, let's just say, boats that are right out there. But apart from the modern materials and design tools that provide the common link between these incredible machines, there's one fundamental piece of kit that has played a big part in making all of this possible. The rig. If you were asked who you thought the largest consumer of carbon in Australasia was, I'm guessing you'd start thinking of boat builders. After all, who else would use 25 tonnes of carbon every year and log over 200,000 project hours in the process? But you'd be barking up the wrong tree. Because the answer is a mask-making company here in New Zealand, Southern Spars. In 34 years, they've built over 800 carbon rigs. They're all over the Grand Prix scene, from inshore to offshore, including 95 TP-52s and just short of 100% of the 2024 Maxi fleet. Their spars have won 19 consecutive Rolex Sydney Hobart races since 2005. And of the 62 rigs that they built for the Volvo Ocean Race competitors, they won every race from 2001. They're also been dominant in the super yacht world. And so the list goes on. But it's the growth and diversity of this company that I find fascinating too. Having started my career in the marine industry working in mass making, I've always been interested in rigs and rigging, especially when the high performance world moved to carbon. Because right from the early days in the 1980s, the huge potential weight savings that carbon promised were clearly going to have big knock-on effects in overall performance and over three decades, that's exactly what's happened. But it hasn't been easy. In the early days, the material was extremely expensive and the build processes were pretty crude. Today, design and production are very different. But Southern Spa's story goes even further, because in addition to dominating the performance and super yacht world, they've helped set a new land sailing speed record, win Olympic medals and set new records for cycling, and now they regularly go into space. And that's why I've come to their facility in Auckland, to see how they do it. But if there's one area that really stands out, it's their America's Cup record. Since their first cup winning mast in 1995 for Black Magic, Southern Spars have produced a staggering 65 America's Cup rigs including some that wouldn't have looked out of place on an aircraft. So I started by asking Southern Spa's founder and managing director Mark Hauser how important the cup had been. Well the cup's been a massive part of this company. You know, like you said, we've been involved since 1992. The development that goes on within that class is just incredible. You know, it's gone from the, the old standard rigs to the version 5s, now into these wings with foiling boats. So yeah, it's, it's, it's big. But you also did the wing mast for the 72 foot foiling cat super in San yeah. Francisco. Yeah. That must have been right out there. I mean, that was, that's barely mast making anymore. That's wing making. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was pretty, it was an interesting time because, you know, Team New Zealand hid that well for a long time because it was the start of the, you know, whole different program. So uh, it was interesting. And then, yeah, the wings were something we hadn't seen before, but they were made up of a whole lot of composite parts. Um, so, yeah, we took that on, we enjoyed it. Um, the wings were, were challenging, but, uh, you know, they, they, they t all turned out very well. Um, it was a nice to do it, Team New Zealand designed it, we built it, um, and we did the same with Prada. Tell me a bit about the scale of the company now. I mean, how many people work here and, and how many masks you produce a year? And... Uh, so there's just under 200 in this building. We, we do about 220,000 hours a year. Um, I think when back in the day when we started it, we probably had 10 or 12 people, and we've grown from there. The growth's been quite, you know, it, 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 it's grown quickly. Um, it's been nice doing that in New Zealand. We've had the people to support it. Um, and, and, and a big team of people are always keen to, to develop and make everything absolutely perfect. Talk me through the process of what happens 
at the beginning of, I guess, an inquiry when someone comes along with a project and said, this is the kind of thing we, we want to build. Presumably, the information comes from the naval architects, from the chief designers. Yes, yeah, we're looking to, to get the, the final version of what they anticipate the riding moment curve will be. That's the fundamental thing that determines how much power the yacht can generate, along with the final agreed sail plan, because it may have moved from the initial one for the sales process. And then we will loop back around on the engineering until we are settled on a... Uh, one of the key things we do at that stage is, is, is set out a load case list. So what are the fundamental load cases or sail sets that this rig, sail package, is going to need to use? And then what's the criteria for each one? How much healing moment are they going to use? Is it a full racing case or is it a cruising or survival type case? And, and we need to map that out because from an engineering perspective we need to have a really clear picture of um, what the load case looks like and what kind of safety factors each case will... Because some of those cases will drive the design and the, the structural engineering really hard and we need to be sure that that's appropriate and that it's um, not unduly over or under, you know, um, weighted relative to the others. So all the drawings will come here first. Um, the guys will uh, get the fibre out of the freezer that's required, um, let that thaw out, and then they'll put it, get it out onto uh, onto the floor here for, for cutting. In this room, we have two Eastman uh, Plotties machines which um, cut all the fibre. And then production and lamination will get the tool down um, to start prepping that for uh, laying laminate. And as we have right here now, we have a 205 tool. This is going to be going in for a 90-foot uh, a boat. Um, the tool will get marked out. It will be signed off by the designer and the project manager to make sure that everything is going into the right place. And to start with, that is all about where the box weave is going to go. Now, we put box weave down anywhere on the mast that there are going to be penetrations. Once that's all done and they've got the basic laminate done, then the mast will be so, um, marked out for patching. Where all the patching goes, where the detang's going to go, where the spread is going to go, the full state. So yeah, they'll put the box weave in. So as we can see, forward spreader one, we're in the forward shell. This is uh, the spreader one area, so this will be what the guys will put in. They have the centre line on the, um, the box of the well that lines up, and that's where that will go in. How long will it take to get all the laminates in place ready to then go on to the next stage, roughly? Is it, are we talking days, weeks? No, weeks. Weeks? weeks. Yeah, right. yeah, it's probably four, three weeks for this one. Really? It's yeah. a big process, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. One of the things that strikes me about composite mask making compared to traditional aluminium mask making is that you've got to have so much of the design, if not all of it, nailed down before it gets anywhere near the floor because you can't move things around can you when you've decided where the stiffening sections are where the components go that's it that's where they go yeah now you're 100 right when once we've laminated all of the local reinforcements and we've cooked it in the autoclave that's where you want to put them and um, what we also see is that there's a production efficiency thing here that if we can get the design done up front and we can get the metal parts out manufactured and sitting on the shelf waiting then when the composite shells hit the floor and the middle parts come together, we can be as efficient as possible in the process of getting the mask through manufacturing and, and to the customer. Once we've completely finished the, the lamination, it's been in the autoclave. You see we've got um, one autoclave over here, which is uh, 54 metres long, and we have another smaller one here, which is 42 metres long. Um, once they've been in there, come out, we pop them out. The first thing we do is ultrasound the mast. So we'll do no work on anything carbon that's come out of here, we'll ultrasound it first to make sure it's, there's no issues with it, and because there's no point going out on the shop floor starting to work away on something and, and find you've got an, an issue and then you've got to fix it. So yeah. Um, yeah. We spend a lot of time planning, yeah. yeah, and there is quite a lot of discussion around the sequence of events and, and when you can start designing a certain thing, when do you have enough information. So then you come all the way back to the start and you say, okay, now we need to make sure that the sail maker has given us the information on the girths of the mainsail when you're reefed so that we can start the boom design. So this, this mast is obviously finished being laminated, it's been through NDT and now it comes onto the shop floor and the first thing the guys do is they mark out the forward section um, because the mast has to be a certain length fore and aft so that's all trimmed, trimmed to suit 
the aft section slightly trimmed as well, all cleaned up, and then they do the, what we call a dry fit. The guys will then come along, they'll drill all the holes because we glue and screw our masks together. Uh, so once this is all done, they will then do the penetrations. They'll drill the spreader compression tubes and glue them in place. They will route it, all the slots for the, the forward locks, the mast head, the, the jib, head stay, and then when, once that's all done, the mast will be pulled apart into two, and then we'll start doing the internals. So we run all the halyards, um, trip lines, anything that's got to be in the mast will be run before we um, join the mast. So we know there shouldn't be any tangles. The odd one does happen, of course. Um, and we've got all the hydraulic fittings are in there, all the vents are in there, all the wiring tubes are in there, and the mouse lines for all the wiring are already run um, up the rig. All the tag lines are up the rig. We have mouse lines that we glue on the inside of the mast, so uh, after the mast comes back from final fit out, the, the final fit out guys can actually hook the, the um, mouse lines out and then they'll pull a new one through and they know it's not twisted or anything. So you're not trying to run a, a, a pipe or something up there to, to mouse a, a halyard in it. So IRC 72 mast, about 32 metres long. Super yacht main mast on a, uh, a big catch. This is 59 metres long. So almost twice the size. Yeah. Uh, but the same process. The mast came in a lamination a while ago and we have to do a um, what we call a super yacht join because we can't laminate a length this long in the autoclave. So we have to do two sections. So when the mast first comes out, we do the super yacht join and then we do the dry fit. Now, the dry fit that's just happened on the 72 over there, this one is slightly further along. It still has all the, the fastenings drilled in it, but it actually has the holes for the compression tubes already drilled in. Um, but yes, the same process. So we've got a wash down vent as well. So some of these boats, they have the pipes up there so you can actually go up the mast and wash it down by just plugging really? your hose in. <laughs> so. But it's not all about masts. New technology and techniques have influenced other areas, as Martin McKelvey explained. So I've been at the team for about 21 years. So I've been through a whole range of different, um, different types of boats and I'm involved in the rig design. You know, the whole uh, building technique and the ultrasounding that now happens to all the masts, um, you know, that's probably a development through, uh, through the AC. The, now all the masts at Southern Spars get ultrasounded as they, as they go through the build process. Mm. So, um, you know, probably the teams can be a bit fussier than uh, other customers, so that's sort of helped uh, Southern, um, you know, improve their, their QC. And it's a bit more like boat building technology. And, um, well, you know, Southern Spa has actually built our AC50 catamaran, so um, similar, similar technology to that. Um, uh, cord, cord laminates, quite thin skin, so, um, yeah, quite a, different, quite a different technique. Righto, so here we are in the paint area for uh, Southern. So this is a, another catch. So we've got the main mast and the mizzen mast here. Um, and this is having a metallic finish. So uh, the, the guys are knocking this back and the mask will go back in for the, the clear coat um, I think this week. So yeah, it's a, another process that we go through here with all the rigs. We've got, uh, as I say, the mizzen mast waiting, the main mast, we've got another mast here that's uh, ready to go on for top coat soon. We have a furling boom down there um, and the mandrel for the, that boom, as well as spreaders and, and everything else. This has um, been into that Yes. Reboot. Yep. Come out for knock they'll it back. knock it back yeah. uh, and then they'll do the top clear, the final clear. Right, okay. And so right it goes now back it's in there. Yes. So in the in the spray booth now are the spreaders for this mast and right. the boom. Right, okay. And one of the booms. So. How do you I mean it's one hell of a length to uh, Yeah, to we get have in the, there. we have five or six gantries here that we'll lift it up, bring it over here and um, as you can see there's some rails on the ground there that the oh, uh, right. we sit it into there and it's pushed in by the boys. Right. All masts sort of vary in, in their complexity, but typically for a super yacht mast like this, are we, how long are we talking about to build the whole thing? Is it a year? Yeah, yeah about it, a year. Really? Yeah. That's a long time, it's isn't a long it? Time. We're building yeah. a mast. Yeah. So this, look at this mast, it looks like it's, it's almost sort of ready to go. I mean, would it be fair to say that we're looking at basically what could be a year's worth of work? That's Pretty much, yes. Could be close to a year on this one. This is a 140 footer. 
um, and yeah, it's, there's only a few more things to go looking at it. We don't do put the spreaders on in the factory and we do not put the rigging on the masts. So the first time the spreaders go on the mast and the rigging goes on the mast is at the yard or um, assembly. Building a super yacht mast is one thing, but how do you get it from an industrial unit on land to the boat? We can only drive about 65 metres on the road and the tallest mast we've done are 95 metres. So what we do is we will um, have to join them on the dock. So we, we build the mast as we have, but we've actually got uh, a top section, a lower section. And we do join them in the factory here. Um, we'll join them off, we'll, we'll um, drill all the holes off as well, and then pull it back apart just to check that it all fits and check the measurements that when it goes together that you know, if it's meant to be 25 metres between spreaders or whatever it is, and then um, it gets pulled apart, the masts go through the factory um, by themselves in the same way as any other mast does with the, the painting, the fit out and everything. They're wrapped up, they put on a, a truck, they go to the wharf, either we've done it in Tower and Auckland, we've joined them before, or we'll join them in Europe. But sometimes it's not just about size. Their expertise in carbon construction has led the company into some unusual areas. Uh, we got involved with Cycling New Zealand, um, building wheels for their, for their velodrome bikes um, and we were able to get hold of a, what was supposed to be the best wheel in the world and we actually ended up building one that was sort of 30 to 40 percent stiffer and 30 to 40 percent lighter. Plus we really worked on the CFD of it so it took the New Zealand team from thirds and fourths to, to winning golds and, and world breaking world records. So that's been really exciting. It's been great working with those athletes and having them in here. Then we also, we're now into aerospace, working with a number of aerospace companies. So building all sorts of stuff that goes into space, which we can't talk too much about, but that's becoming a bigger and bigger part of our business and we intend to grow it. And you've also got a world sailing land speed record. I think I've got that round the right way. Yeah, yeah that was fun getting involved with Glenn on that. Um, and, you know, I think, I hope that you'll see some more of that. I mean, he, he broke the record, he did extremely well, um, but I, I'm pretty sure if you spoke to Glenn, he'd be saying there's more to go. So, you know, that was a cool project too. Yeah. And quite different from what anyone has seen before. So, projects that all have advanced carbon construction at their heart. Which begs the question, could any of this be achieved without the black stuff? If you have a look at the size of the boats we're building now, and you tried to build them out of aluminium, it just wouldn't work. They're too heavy, way too heavy, and there's a whole lot of other issues around aluminium where you, which you don't have to deal with with carbon fibre. So, you know, I don't think you'd be seeing the boats get as big as they are now. Um, I don't think you'd see them being used like they are now. So it's definitely changed the world. The, the, definitely the sport as a whole, carbon fibre has changed the whole, changed the whole game. Um, I was around when we used to build aluminium masts for uh, Volvo boats and, and IMS, IOR boats, but um, yeah, the carbons, it's just, it's changed the whole game. Could any of this have happened without carbon? No, 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 definitely not. So that's clear. In the next episode, we'll get on board the biggest sailing catch in the world to find out what it's really like to handle such huge rigs. Plus, we find out how one much smaller project transformed their performance by changing their stick.